my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. This episode is sponsored by Caraway Home. It's time to ditch the chemicals and cook healthier for you and your family with Caraway Home's non toxic cookware and bakeware. Caraway Home has a cookware and bakeware set that all come in the most beautiful colors, and all Caraway Home sets come equipped with easy access storage solutions so that no stacking is required and you won't be constantly misplacing your lids. I have the cookware set in the sage green color and I'm obsessed with it. It's a modern and chemical free version of the traditional 16 piece set pared down to just four essentials, a fry pan, saute pan, sauce pan, and Dutch oven with lids for everything. Plus a pretty and functional storage setup comes included with the set. Our family eats so many eggs and you guys know the struggle with eggs sticking to the pan and this is not a problem at all with my caraway home pans. It's amazing that you could have a nonstick surface without all of the nasty chemicals. You honestly have to see these sets to truly appreciate the genius and beauty behind them. Visit carawayhome.com slash birth hour to take advantage of this limited time offer for 10% off your next purchase. This deal is exclusive for our listeners. So visit carawayhome.com slash birth hour or use code birth hour at checkout. Caraway, non-toxic cookware made modern. Today's episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Our mental health affects how we experience life, maybe more than anything else, which is why it's so important to invest time and care into your mental well-being. I never felt like I really needed therapy before becoming a mom, but it has had such a huge impact on my mental health as a parent. And this comes up all the time in our Zoom calls with our community, so I know I'm not alone in this. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat-only therapy sessions. So you don't even have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. I love that BetterHelp is so much more affordable and convenient than in-person therapy. For many people, the barrier to getting therapy is finding a therapist, especially for everyone out there who is pregnant or has a new baby at home. With BetterHelp, you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash birth hour. That's betterhelp.com slash birth hour. Before we get to today's episode, I just want to remind everybody about our childbirth course. It's called Know Your Options. It's all online at your own pace. You get lifetime access to it. Everything is evidence-based and it's 12 modules that really helps you prepare for birth as well as the postpartum and newborn days. We want to help you feel empowered to speak up when it comes to your labor and make decisions based on what you want your birth to look like. We give you all the options so you can choose where and how to give birth based on all the most up-to-date evidence-based information, coupled with learning to trust your instincts and make decisions based on what is right for you. We're so proud of this course, and I feel like there must just be a baby boom right now because we've had so many new students joining, and then we get to know you on the Zoom calls that we do every other week, as well as in our private Facebook group. So to get all the detailed information about this course, just head over to thebirthhour.com slash course. And right now you can still use the coupon code. It's 100OFF for $100 off your enrollment. So again, that's thebirthhour.com slash course and coupon code 100OFF. Today's birth story guest is Mary. She has three stories to share, two at the hospital and one home birth. And she talks about how they're all different, but we're really beautiful and healing in their own ways. All right, let's hear from Mary. Hi, Mary. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Hi, Bryn. Thank you for having me. I'm so incredibly excited. Awesome. All right. Well, we've got three birth stories to get to today. So before we get to those, will you tell listeners a little bit about you and your family? Yes. Um, so as you said, my name is Mary Johnson. I'm 32 years old. I've been married to my husband, David, for nine years. We've known each other for 26, which is kind of crazy. Um, and together we have three babes, uh, Eloise, who is five, all of or Bear, who is three, and Primrose or Jones, who is 16 months. We live in Bakersfield, California. I'm a stay-at-home mom with a side hustle of making custom cakes from home. All right. So we're going to hear all three birth stories. So let's start with your first pregnancy and what that looked like for you. Yeah. So I, I knew from a, just being a young child that I always wanted to be a mom. I was kind of fascinated with birth 
and pregnancy. When I was younger, I used to watch uh, Bringing Home Baby or a baby story on TLC. And it was just always incredible to see what the woman's body could do carrying a baby and giving birth. I'm not totally sure what got me interested in in an unmedicated birth, but uh, I had definitely just kind of hopped on that train and was was ready for it. So once we decided we wanted to have a baby, uh, my personality is very kind of type A. I like to have control. And uh, I'd been tracking my periods and was always pretty regular. So I figured, you know, it it shouldn't take too long. No one in my family has struggled with uh, infertility. You know, so we we tried and the first couple months were still disappointing. Once you decide you want a baby, you want a baby yesterday. (laughs) But, you know, the first few months, I didn't really think anything of it. But then the months went on and turned into a year. I went to my OB to kind of just check things out and she said, you know, everything seems normal. Just, you know, try and relax and keep going, which is kind of impossible to tell someone when, <laughs> when you want a baby. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, it, we, we just kept trying and it turned into almost about two years. It was a little shy of two years. And right before that, my husband and I uh, made a big change to our diet. We went pretty plant-based and kind of whole plant-based. You know, we cut a lot of refined things out of our diet. And I'm not saying that that's what, what it was for me, my story, uh, that kind of has an impact, but I conceived within a month of changing my diet. (laughs) So that was pretty fun and crazy. So I found out I I waited about 10 days once my period was late. I don't know how I waited that long. Yeah, that's willpower, especially after trying for so long. (laughs) I think that that's what I I was just kind of done with. Yeah. The double struggle of... Disappointment of like... Exactly. The, the negative test. Testing and then getting your period. Exactly. Uh, somehow I, I agonizingly waited 10 days and and I took the test and it was positive. I took another one and I wanted to tell my husband in a cute way, but I had no willpower. I just ran out of the bathroom and <laughs> said, this is not a drill. I'm pregnant. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how people wait. It's always very <laughs> impressive to me. Right. I just, yeah, I, very strong willpower. We we told our family in a cute way. I worked at a bakery and we had them make some cute cookies that looked like a pregnancy test. Um, so with them, I could wait a little bit. Uh, so yeah, I found out and about six weeks on, I had all day sickness. I refuse to call it morning sickness. It is not morning. It is all day. <laughs> the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed, pretty much. So yeah, I had that from about six to 12 weeks. Um, I never threw up. So no slight relief with that. It was just constant. And I worked at a bakery at the time. So there were all kinds of smells. And yeah, it was it was an experience. Um, there was one trick, though, that I've never heard anyone say. Uh, I had heard it, but and I was just desperate. It sounds absolutely disgusting now. But it was to drink deflated Pepsi before getting out of bed. So I would pour my like half a cup of Pepsi and put it on my nightstand overnight. Again, absolutely disgusting. And then I would wake up and I would sip it. And I think I want to say it held the nausea at bay at least until I got to work. That's so interesting. When I was little, my mom would always give us like decarbonated Sprite when we had stomach aches. Oh, okay. I don't know if it was just to get fluids in us or what, but I've never heard that of her pregnancy, especially with Pepsi. <laughs> right. And it was specifically Pepsi. Mm. And so I always had my bottle of Pepsi. And yeah, now just thinking about that just makes my stomach turn. Yeah. But yeah, I did it and, and I, I think it worked a little bit. Maybe it was Whatever a mind thing. Whatever works, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so besides being just sick till about 12 weeks, I really struggled with varicose veins. I already kind of struggle with that, but they just were were amplified when pregnant. And so that was that was fun. But yeah, I just, I was okay to stay pregnant the whole time. I, I loved being pregnant. So, which leads me then to the day uh, I went into labor. So my due date was February 18th and my husband's birthday is February 6th. So he, the whole time was saying, oh, maybe, maybe she'll be born on my birthday. And I just kept reminding him, you know, first babies almost always go late. There, there's no way. Well, on February 6th, <laughs> when I was 38 and one, my water started leaking a little bit. And I wasn't totally sure if it was my waters. Um, I, you know, there's just all kinds of things leaking down there at that point. But I was very conscious of waters leaking. Um, unfortunately, my my husband's aunt many years ago with her first, she was full term and, and her waters broke a little bit without her being aware. 
and they ended up losing the baby and it was just absolutely devastating. Um, so, you know, I always just thought if your waters break, it's, it's a big gush, you know. So I was just very conscious of that. So with that, when I saw a little bit of leaking, I called the advice nurse and, uh, I was GBS positive. So she recommended I go in to the hospital So we went in and the whole time my husband is saying, she's going to be born on my birthday. And I kept saying, no, you know, just, just hold your horses. There's no way, there's no way. This is the first. And this was probably at about 10 AM. Um, so we got to the hospital at maybe 1130, got checked and was confirmed my waters had broken and I was about two centimeters dilated. Uh, so we got a room at maybe about 1230 and contractions had started, but weren't, they weren't really bad. They were more like period cramps. But by about 1.30 or 2, they were just one on top of each other. Very intense, no breaks. Um, I remember even just laying there thinking, this isn't how labor is supposed to go. You're supposed to have a, a contraction and then you get to breathe and then you have another contraction. But I wasn't very well prepared. So I was fighting them just curled up. I don't really remember too much from that point on. Um, I was just laying in the bed, eyes closed. I don't remember when my sister and my mom-in-law came in the room. So at about 5 p.m., the nurse checked me and she said I was six centimeters. And I said, screw it. Give me the epidural. I'm done. This, yeah, I'm just done. And again, I don't remember too much from that point, but one little thing I remember was my mom-in-law just in the corner and I just hear her so quietly say, oh, praise God. <laughs> when, when I said, give me the epidural, uh, which was just so funny to me. Uh, so the, the epidural, uh, the anesthesiologist came in maybe about 15 or 20 minutes later um, and my family had to all leave, even my husband, which I was not prepared for. Um, the contractions were just one on top of another. And uh, I remember telling them, you know, can you just wait for the peak to go down to administer the epidural? And um, they said, you know, we'll, we'll wait a, a little bit. And I just wasn't telling them any time. And so they, they said, you know, we, we have to do this now. And I just kept saying, I can't, you know, I can't. I, I'm, this, is, this is still going. Um, and in hindsight, I, I see that I was going through transition, getting my epidural. So they administered it. And before the bed was even lowered back down, my legs started what I remember feeling like convulsing. And I started freaking out and, you know, telling the nurse, well, what's, what's going on? And, and she checked me and she said, oh, you're, you're 10 centimeters. You're, you're ready to go. So my family came back in and, and I said, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to push. Uh, so I got ready, started pushing. I pushed for about 40 minutes uh, which felt like way longer. Everyone kept telling me, she's almost here, she's almost here. And I would just say, stop lying to me. You've said that for like 10 minutes and, and she's not here. Uh, but at one point the doctor said, you know, do you, do you want to feel her head? And so he, he guided my hands down there. And I honestly did not know what I was touching. I could have been touching my leg. I don't know, but he said it was her head. So I was very encouraged and it feels so weird, doesn't it? I feel like they don't talk yeah, about that feel enough on the podcast. It's like, <laughs> I think I only did it with one of mine and it was like, yeah, like the top of your nose maybe or something like, yeah, yeah, it just feels lumpy and- yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, okay, you're telling me it's her head. It's her head. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I I pushed her out at, at 631 on my husband's birthday, and his team had won the Super Bowl the day before. So it was his year. He was absolutely ecstatic. And he just kept saying, I have a birthday buddy, and it's the best birthday ever. And and yeah, I had to say, okay, dude, I'm sorry. You were right. <laughs> she came. She came on your birthday. So I, I did tear a little bit um, on either side with her, but it, it wasn't too bad. You know, they stitched me up. Um, I had the golden hour with her. Though, so she nursed well in the hospital, but once we got home, she didn't really want to nurse very much. So for the first two and a half months, um, I exclusively pumped but I was just, I was bound and determined. So uh, one day she just, she, she took it and then she nursed, um, until she was about almost 18 months. Um, but because I had been pumping, I massively overproduced and had no really idea of how to bring that down. So I was constantly engorged. Um, I ended up, I filled my two freezers and was able to donate like nine or 10 Trader Joe bag full 
to other moms, other local moms. And it was, it was great to be able to do that, but it was also just really hard, um, hard on my body. And then with her coming two weeks early, I really enjoyed being pregnant and I struggled with the guilt of feeling like I was robbed of those two to four weeks that I had planned with her still being in my tummy and, you know, being sad that I don't get to sleep anymore. And, and like this, this little human, I love her to death, but she wakes me up all the time and, and I want my sleep and, uh, so all of that, but yeah, we just, you know, we, we worked through it and I fell more and more in love with her and got to know who this little new human was. And so that was that was fun. All right. So do you want to share anything from that postpartum? I mean, yeah, not really. Just I already kind of struggled with depression a bit. So I had a bit of postpartum depression, but you know, we wrote it out and made it through. (laughs) Okay. All right. Well, you'll have to kind of compare and contrast the different postpartums when we get to the end here, but let's go ahead and talk about your next pregnancy and just kind of that decision to try again, whether it was a long journey again or not. No, he was a surprise. Uh, Same for me with number two. (laughs) Yeah, it's just, I knew that there was one time where we might have slipped up and we might have made a baby. But I remember thinking, there's no way. There's no way. We we tried for two years, one slip up. Well, let me tell you, one slip up can make a baby. (laughs) And that's how we have my son. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Had you gotten your period back yet? Yeah, but maybe maybe like once or twice. Uh, okay, see with ours, I hadn't even got my period yet. So, I mean, we were still being oh, careful, right, uh, but yeah, total surprise. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. So my daughter was uh, maybe a little over a year and we found out that, yeah, so they were going to be about 22 months apart. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it was it was a shock, but, but it, it was a good shock. We knew we wanted to have more kids. We just, my plan was maybe a three-year gap, um, but... Right. It turned out a two year, so we were we were we were ready. <laughs> yeah, I feel like it's a shock, like when it happens because you still have this baby, but then by the yeah. time it's born, you know, nine months later, it feels like a, a bigger gap there. <laughs> I just remember looking at my baby and being like, "How am I about to have another baby?" <laughs> <laughs> right? There's another one of you coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man, yeah. So it was a surprise, mm-hmm. um, and again, I just came out and told my husband, "Well, we we, we did it again. We have another <laughs> another little baby." Coming. Um, and we were excited, but I was very determined to have an unmedicated birth this time. Um, I was very aware of my diet. Um, I made sure to exercise, you know, move my body a lot. Um, even how I sat before with my first, when I would get off of work, um, I was working full time with my first and, and then I was a stay at home mom with, uh, my second. And with my first, I would just, as soon as I got off, I would just lay on the couch, but with my second pregnancy, I would either sit on the birth ball or I would sit, but kind of, you know, like lean over a chair. I just really wanted to ensure that he was going to be in the optimal position. Um, that's when I became enthralled with birth even more. And that's when I found your podcast, um, which I just listened to it religiously so much so that I would usually listen to it, especially when I was going into the shower and, and I had it on in your intro where a woman says, uh, I think my water just broke. My husband heard it and he said, you're what? <laughs> That I would say my water broke, and I was like, no, 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 it was, it was just a podcast. Um, <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so I, I remind and let him listen to the whole thing. Okay, this is not me saying this. You know, if you hear this, because you're going to be hearing it a lot. Uh, so that was that was funny. Um, yeah. So I would get up before my daughter and and do uh, prenatal yoga, um, and then just watch YouTube birth videos, uh, hospital, medicated, unmedicated, home birth. I just could not get enough of it. Um, and my daughter would, you know, come out sometimes and, and get to watch him with me, which was, which was fine. I don't think she really noticed or cared too much. She was still pretty little, but <laughs> I was still like, I want you to, to love this. <laughs> so I never had any fear going into birth with my first. Um, in fact, I was, I was super excited. I, I looked forward to it almost like it was Disneyland. Uh, but with my second, I was still excited, but I had little blips of fear here and there and you know just kind of knowing what I was what I was getting into a little bit more and one day I was listening to the podcast and I believe it was Jennifer Mancuso hopefully I said her name correctly mm-hmm. uh, telling her spur stories about her twins and 
I don't know if it was her strong advocacy for herself and her twins um, and, you know, just seeing how much she, she had to fight for what she, what she wanted and felt was safest. Uh, but there, it just kind of ignited that extreme passion I had again. And any fear was just gone after that episode. Uh, I remember coming home and telling my husband, I was like, I'm, I'm so excited again. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not afraid. And he was like, great. <laughs> you know? That's, that's wonderful. But yeah, that, that really, that really stuck with me. My doctor, I had the same OB for my first and second, and she was incredible. She never questioned any of my requests, um, not wanting to get like the flu vaccine or testing my blood sugars with a finger prick instead of the drink or my diet, you know, eating a plant-based diet. She just respected them and said, yeah, you know, every, everything's showing up well. Throughout my pregnancy, I had to see a few other doctors, you know, they would just, they would question, why did you want to do the finger prick instead of the glucose test? One of the doctors said, there's not that much sugar in, in the drink. And I was like, dude, it's the whole point of it. It's pure sugar. Um, and, uh, one of the times I asked, it was later in my pregnancy and I asked what position is the baby in? And she said, oh, you know, this was not my OB, but she said, well, head down. And I said, well, no, no, no. Anterior, posterior, you know, what, what position? And she looked at me and said, it doesn't matter. The baby's head down. That's all that matters. I was just so thankful, so thankful for my OB and our open, honest conversations throughout my pregnancy. You know, I really trusted her. So then at about 39 weeks, at my 39-week appointment, I saw a different OB, again, not my regular OB, uh, and he tried to do a membrane sweep. And I, he said, you know, he, he couldn't uh, because I was only about 70% effaced and one and a half to two centimeters. And I left there feeling so discouraged. I told my husband, I, I called him crying and I said, you know, I, I don't know why I'm crying. I, I love being pregnant. I could be pregnant for another two months. I love this, but I, I just feel really discouraged. <laughs> and he just, you know, he, he comforted me and said, you know, it'll, it'll be okay. And I think my, my, my biggest thing was my son's due date was December 22nd. And I did not want him to be born on Christmas day. I don't, I don't want my child to have to compete with Christmas. <laughs> so this was on the, uh, you know, about a week earlier than that. And I, um, yeah, so I just said, okay, well, let's, let's hope you stay in for Christmas and we'll have an after Christmas baby. But on the morning of about December 20th, I just had this weird feeling that maybe something was was going on so much so that I, I finished packing my daughter's bag. I had maybe a few minor cramps, but nothing really. Um, I lost part of our mucus plug and my husband and I went to his work Christmas party that night. Um, and there I had a bit more cramping. I had my bloody show. Um, so I told my husband and we, we started heading home. Um, and then by then I, I started having a bit more contractions. I was able to kind of time them on the way home. And so, uh, we, we got home and I, again, I thought my water was breaking a little bit. i that just seems to be kind of a pattern with me <laughs> always thinking my water's breaking. Uh, so since I was again, GBS positive, we, we headed to the hospital at about maybe 10 PM. Um, they checked me and the water test, the amniotic fluid test was inconclusive. So they said, you know, we'll just monitor you for about an hour and see how, how that goes. Um, and in that hour, I would just do squats every time I had a contraction, you know, just kind of hold on to like a counter and I walked around and, and I progressed about two centimeters in that, in that hour. So they admitted me and I just labored on the birth ball. My mom and sister came to keep us company and, you know, they were, they were going to be there uh, for the birth. And I just, you know, I would breathe the contractions and I remember being so encouraged because I would have a break between the contractions. I would be talking to my sister, take a deep breath, you know, vocalize a little bit and then continue on. Oh yeah. So this store, you know, we were talking about. And uh, so at about two 30, the nurse came in and checked and I was six centimeters and I was so excited. That was the point where I was ready to get that epidural last time. And this time I was thinking I've, I've got this, you know, I can do this. They got a lot more intense shortly after that. And again, I thought my water was breaking a little bit. So we called the nurse. She came in and, and said, you know, go ahead and get up on the bed. And once on the bed, then my water really broke all over movie style. Just, I think I even said, oh, we got a gusher. <laughs> it's just everywhere. Uh, so, you know, the nurse changed my, my bedding and, and headed out. And then almost immediately I had a massive contraction and I just said, he's coming. 
So my sister pushed the nurse button. The nurse came in and she was a little confused, but you know what, what's going on. And we told her and, and she checked and she said, Oh yeah, no, you're, you're, you're 10 centimeters. Uh, to which she proceeded to push my legs together and push them to the side and say, let, let me, let me go call the doctor. <laughs> I was just, the, the fetal ejection reflex had, had basically kicked in. Uh, and I was, I felt pretty out of control for these I don't know, maybe five, 10 minutes. Um, I just kind of felt like I probably looked like the exorcist. I was kind of like contorting my back and like pushing away. And, but it literally felt like I was vomiting out of my vagina. I had no control. And the, you know, the doctor came in pretty quickly and, uh, was saying, you know, put put, mama, you know, put, put your legs up here, put your, and my husband and sister had to physically put my legs up in the stirrups because I could not, do anything. <laughs> I was just trying to not fall off the bed. Um, and, uh, the doctor was, was trying to stretch me a little bit. And I just, I think it was maybe two pushes and the doctor said, he's here. And I said, what? And she held him up. Cause I, I honestly did not believe her that, that he had already come out. And sure enough at three thirty one on December 21st, he was born and he weighed seven pounds, three ounces. And I didn't tear Oh, I thought for sure I'm with how fast he shot out. I've torn up to the wazoo, but nope, I did not tear. And so that that made recovery a lot easier. There, it was just I felt great. I could have gotten up almost immediately and walked around, and I just felt like my normal self immediately, which was wonderful. And he wasn't born on Christmas. Yeah, you got a nice little buffer there. <laughs> <laughs> just enough time. A little one. <laughs> Exactly. And the tax write off. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. With my December 31st baby, I got a lot of comments about that. <laughs> yes. We did find out he had a tongue tie. So that, that made nursing mm. um, immediately after pretty, a little painful, but we were able to get that clipped um, before leaving. And then, yeah, it was just, we had another little human. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything different from this postpartum that you want to share about? Um, I feel like I had a, a little more rage this time, mm. postpartum rage and anxiety. The first time was a little more depression, but, mm. um, yeah, I just, I remember one point he wouldn't go to sleep and he was, he was maybe like a month or two old and he, he wouldn't go to sleep at nighttime. And I remember just sitting on the floor and like banging the carpet, just being so, and, and that, that picture is just very, I, I, I remember that very vividly because that's when I realized, okay, this is not normal. Yeah. <laughs> Banging on the carpet because my newborn won't go to sleep. Um, and so, yeah, that's when I realized, I think, I think I've got a, a little more rage postpartum this, this time around with it, with a sprinkling of depression, just, you know, sprinkled in there a little bit. <laughs> was there anything that helped with that or just kind of recognizing what was going on? I think, I mean, in the moment, I didn't recognize very well. Mm. I, at that point, I was doing my custom cakes from home, and I went back to taking orders maybe a month after he was born, thinking, I feel great. Everything's great. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of pressure, too, like getting something perfect for somebody's event. Yes, and and my, my husband, I remember just saying one time, he was like, he's a baby. He doesn't know you have this cake you have to do. He's just a baby that wants his, his mom and, and milk. And, and that's, and so, yeah, my husband, my husband was very supportive and, and just tried to remind me, you know, I, I'm going to do everything. You just, you just lay there and take care of the baby. That's, that's your job and heal. Um, so yeah, he, but my personality, <laughs> I just, I always just push back. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so moms, don't push back. Receive it. Receive the help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. So that then leads into yet another surprise pregnancy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we are not very good at this. <laughs> <laughs> so this one was, was interesting because uh, my husband actually was the first one that said, you should, you should take a pregnancy test. And I said, no way, no way. I was just feeling off. I would have weird stomach pains. I thought I was going through, I just had got a stomach bug. Um, so he just kept pushing it. And, uh, and I said, okay, fine. But then like, you have to be in the bathroom with me when, when we read the test, because you already know I can't do some fun way to tell you. So he was. And I looked at it. I waited a few moments. I looked at it and I said, ah, it's, it's negative. And I walked away and he just kept looking at it and he's like, honey, I 
I think this is two lines. And, and I looked at it, I said, there's no way. I've heard so many stories of women taking the test, looking at it, walking away, and then later seeing it was positive. And I would always wonder, how did they do that? What kind of self-control or just, I, I, I didn't get it. And then that was me. <laughs> I, I just, yeah. So, so my husband actually told me that I was pregnant. <laughs> Which was fun. That's awesome. (laughs) Uh, And then again, just all day sickness from about six to, I think, like 16 weeks. Um, This was going to be a surprise. Uh, We weren't going to find out the gender of this baby, which was really fun. Uh, We almost did that with my second, but my husband just really wanted to know. So yeah, and then uh, I was pursuing a home birth, which was my absolute dream, uh, I'd wanted a home birth with my others, but it just it just wasn't financially feasible. It was going to be a lot cheaper for us to just go through the hospital, um, which is really unfortunate. But but with this one, we we got to pursue that. So uh, everything just kind of went along. Again, uh, those lovely varicose veins just added so much. I want to say that that was after the nausea, the first trimester and part of second was just those lovely varicose veins. Yeah. And then, yeah, just getting to have the wonderful midwife care uh, throughout the pregnancy was was just lovely. We were excited with, with getting pregnant, but this was uh, April of 2020. So COVID was still really new and, you know, we didn't know how it would affect me or the baby. Um, so that was just kind of, you know, underlying throughout the pregnancy. So everything, you know, just routine pregnancy um, at about 37 weeks and six days. So I've never made it to my 40 week guest date with any of my, with my two previous babies at 37 and six. Uh, we have a friend who lives with us and she called to tell me she tested positive for COVID, which was just, Oh no. Yeah. I, I even went on the, I'm part of the Patreon group and uh, I went on Facebook that day and was just yeah. venting. What am I going to do? I've never made it to 40 weeks. I have this home birth. I, I like thinking I knew it was too good to be true. Mm. Um, and, and everyone on there was so sweet and just, you know, encouraged it, it'll be great, you know, and just going through all of the scenarios. What do we do if I test positive, if my husband, Um, and then my husband started having symptoms the next day. So he's self-isolated. Uh, thankfully he got a negative test shortly after he started showing symptoms. And then we tested the, our self-isolation or our isolation ended, uh, on my guest date. So we made it, I held the baby in and then it was just game on, get this baby out now while we're in the clear. I did everything. Basically I did the pineapple core, uh, curb walking, spicy food, nonstop, hikes. My, my husband and I even had sex. We all know how that is the last thing you want to do when you are 41 at plus days. But yeah, <laughs> but you're also willing to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I was like, get this baby out. <laughs> um, so we, I had to have a biophysical profile after, after going past 40 weeks and I didn't get to see the OB that I usually that I saw for my first two pregnancies, uh, it was it was a different OB, and and it was just again it just it really made me appreciate my OB that I had had and my midwife. Um, I have a past uh, eating disorder, and I didn't want to know how much I weighed with this pregnancy. Uh, and I mentioned to him when he was looking at my chart, and he looks at it and just says, "Oh wow, well let let's just put it this way: don't gain any more weight." Mm, that's helpful. Yeah. And I just thought, wow, thanks, dude. That's, I, I just, you know, mm-hmm. I just told you I didn't want to know that. So it, again, it just made me so thankful for, um, for my OB and, and my midwife. So at about 41 and three, my, my midwife, uh, attempted a sweep, uh, and administered some primrose oil. And then at 41 and four, I actually had two guest dates, uh, so 41 and four and also 41 and six, on January 20th, in the evening, I started feeling uh, slight crimping. So I was like, okay, maybe this is the day. Uh, and this this was the most anticipated day, I feel. Um, I know that that's putting a lot of, pre- it's putting a lot of pressure on her birth. Uh, but it was just, with my first, you know, I didn't really know what I was getting into. With my second, I was so 
desperate to try for an unmedicated birth. So I felt in a way I had to accomplish this goal. With this third labor, I was getting my home birth. It was, all the pieces were just, had fallen into place. And I, I was just over the moon, ecstatic. Um, so I, we put our babies to bed and at about 6.30, you know, I started feeling them. By about 8.30 that night, uh, I had called the midwife, you know, and told her, I think tonight's the night, things are steady. Uh, we called our, our team together and I labor on the ball. I was breathing through contractions. There was one point where this song came on uh, called You Set My World on Fire. And I just I just started crying. And my sister, you know, checked, are, are you okay? And I just I just said, you know what? It's these are these are happy tears. I've heard this song so many times and just pictured laboring to it. And and here it is. It's it's happening. Uh, and just being so, so excited and so at peace with everything. By about 11.30, things had gotten really intense, just breathing through it. I wasn't sure if my midwife was going to make it, uh, but by midnight, she was there. She checked me, and I was six to seven centimeters and 100% effaced. And when she checked me, I remember I was laying on the bed, and I was having a contraction. And when the contraction passed, I looked at her, and I was like, can I get up? And she said, of course, you can, you can do whatever you want. Uh, and it was at that point when I really realized I'm in control of this this whole situation. I mean, as far as you know, as far as a mom can be in control of <laughs> giving birth, <laughs> but uh, the, I, you know, I get to say what I want to do with my body and where I want to move. Uh, so I got into the pool and almost immediately started feeling pushy. And so I just, yeah, I just started kind of kind of pushing a bit with the contractions. Uh, my midwife notes, uh, said, you know, I started pushing at about 12, 29. Um, and she never checked me again. She just would check the baby's heart tones. And, and at one point she told me, you know, see if you can feel the baby's head. And I thought, you know, surely not, but I did. And I, and this time I, I actually knew, I, I knew it wasn't me. I knew I was feeling the baby's head and I was so encouraged. Uh, I just kept my hands there the whole time and would just feel, uh, you know, the baby progressing with every contraction, I would feel the baby come down further and further. So I, the baby started crowning. Um, and I, you know, I, I felt, I felt that lovely ring of fire and my water broke just as, uh, my daughter's head came out at 1251. And I had a few moments, uh, of a break without any contractions after her head came out before, uh, before she was born and I felt the contraction coming on and it was, it was pretty dark in the house. Um, because you know, it was, it was nighttime, but I remember saying to everyone, I was like, anyone who wants to see a baby come out of a vagina better come over right here and look because she's coming. <laughs> so she just, yeah. And, and in one contraction, she, she came out. Uh, so at 1254, she was born and I got to pull her right up to my chest immediately. And she still had the sack on her face. So my, my midwife immediately, you know, took, took that off of her face. Um, and I was just, I was elated. I was over the moon. Um, and so much so that I forgot, which I've heard on the podcast, you know, people forget to, to check what, what is the baby? Uh, so my sister asked, you know, what's, what's the baby? And I looked and I, I thought the whole time, this, this is a boy. I even mentioned, I think I felt balls as I pulled her up. Uh, but I looked and, and she was a little girl and, uh, I, I was shocked. That's one of the pictures I, I sent to you, uh, was my face when I found out that she was a girl. I was just absolutely shocked. And I even had the midwife double check, <laughs> just, just making sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, yeah. So, and then my midwife, uh, was incredible. She had had back-to-back -back births and she actually had to leave almost right away. And, and the second midwife was there and she ended up giving birth to her own baby two days later. Oh my gosh. <laughs> After my, <laughs> yes. She went into labor the following day and then had her own little girl, uh, two days later. So yeah, she's, she's just, she's wonderful. I love her. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So, and, and then we, we got to do kind of a modified breast crawl. Mm. I couldn't totally not do anything. I had to help just a tiny bit, but it was, it was incredible. It was something I'd always wanted to witness. Um, just the, you know, the little baby nuzzling up yeah. and it was, it was wonderful. 
All right. And so then how was the postpartum this time? Uh, postpartum was good. Um, I loved being home. She had, uh, the midwife found a tongue and lip tie, which was, again, that's always fun. Um, and just, even though she was my third baby, I was nursing. It's, it's like your boobs just have to toughen up again every time. So I just think, oh, you know, it's it's going to be a breeze. I've done this before. Um, but yeah, with each baby, it just seems to be a learning curve. Um, this is my third. And I still thought, you know, how long, how long is it going to, is it going to be uncomfortable? And, and then those after pains, oh, they do get intense with every baby. Mm-hmm. And that is, that's fun. That's fun <laughs> to be nursing a baby and then just all of a sudden have these intense pains, but no baby that you're working towards getting out. Exactly. Yeah. It feels like a contraction, but you're not yes. working towards anything. And you're typically kind of stuck with a baby on your boob and can't even like really get into a position that's more comfortable. Exactly. And for me, what, what usually helps, I mean, this, this is the birth hour, so there's no TMI, is just trying to go poop. Hmm. And it's right after I get the baby on. So yeah, desperate times call for desperate measures. Yeah, because the latch is what triggers those afterbirth pains too, I think. Yes, yes. Ugh, good times. There was a tincture that I used after my second that my midwife gave me. Um, I think it's called After Ease. And I don't know if it did anything or not, but at least it was like when it happened, it felt like I was doing something, you know, like give me my yes. t-shirt. Because <laughs> right. you really, there's not much else you could do. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, that would be me. <laughs> anything. I'm desperate. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Uh, yeah. And then just postpartum, you know, postpartum is just, it's a hard time. It's just a hard time. I feel like no matter how many babies you have, the more babies I had, the more I learned to realize with my type A personality, this is just a small season. It will pass. Uh, You only get those struggles so much. And uh, yeah, so I I feel like I took, especially with thinking that she she may be our our last uh, biological baby, we just you know, I tried to take those snuggles in a bit more and I still had a bit of depression, um, trying to juggle three babes. We had three, three and under for about a month or two. Mm. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's just fun. (laughs) Yeah. Was your husband able to be home for a while or? He was, he was, he was just transitioning to a new job. So he had, I think a month off after Awesome. Which, yeah, it was glorious. We weren't sure at first, especially with her going over. We thought, mm-hmm. oh, you know, she'll this baby will be out by forty weeks, and it just kept getting pushed. But they were they were very very kind with him and just said, yeah, you know, no, just just take your time. Um, and I was just very honest. I was very honest with, I'm struggling. This is a hard day. Um, and once my husband did go back to work, I basically lived at my sister's house. I would just go to her house basically every day. And we would just be there all day with her kids and uh, just come home at bedtime. That's awesome. (laughs) It really helped. Very cool. Yeah. The third postpartum for me was the one where I really soaked up all the newborn snuggles too, especially having two older kids that kind of play together. I was just like, you guys are downstairs with dad and I'm up here just with this sleeping baby sweating all over me all day long. It was great. (laughs) My husband would come back in and be like, have y'all moved? I'm like, no, I kind of need to pee, but I'm good. (laughs) Right. I'm holding it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I think I watched the whole show of Call the Midwife. Nice. Just (laughs) laying in bed, watching my, you know, snuggling my my newborn. And yeah, yeah, it was great. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, anything else you want to share from your story or do you want to go ahead and talk about resources? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that was it. So I guess my top resource is always the birth hour. I tell all my friends, (laughs) whatever kind of birth and labor you are planning on having, you know, just, just listen to them. It's so wonderful and informative. And then uh, also just have a mom tribe, Mm -hmm. tribe of friends that you can be open and honest with. I have some of those and they've you know, you can you can just tell them today really sucks. I love my children, but this really sucks. And they don't judge you. <laughs> they know, they know all the things. Yeah, 
being able to vent is huge. Yes. Yes. And encouraging. Um, but yeah, just a lot of my resources I feel were not necessarily, I had a few that were birth related, Mm -hmm. but a lot of them are like kids. So like big little feelings, gentle parenting, and then like pelvic floor accounts. Okay. We can put those on the show notes page. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. All right. And then what's the best place for people to reach out to you? Um, my Instagram. So I have two, um, my cake one is my public account. So that's cakes underscore by underscore Mary Elizabeth. Um, or my private account is call me Murray. It's an old account. Um, Mm -hmm. but yeah, anyone feel free to message me. I'd love to talk, answer any questions. I love all things birth and labor. (laughs) All right. Wonderful. And like you mentioned, you're active in our Patreon group as well. So patrons that are listening can hit you up in the group too. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much, friend. Thanks again to Mary for sharing her stories with us. And if you want more information from today's episode, just head over to thebirthhour.com and search for Mary's name in the search bar to find her show notes page, which will have links to all of her resources, pictures, and information about today's sponsors. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.